Um, I'd now, I guess I'm, am I moving to your right or my left or something over this table? By the afternoon, I'll have fallen off. Um, but I'd like to introduce uh, the second panel uh, chair, uh, Stan Delaney, and tell you a bit about what this panel is about. I, I, I said in my opening remarks that the theme of the whole day is equality and that our second panel's focus would be on uh, sort of put it in, infusing equality into how people practice law. Um, let me take a moment to give you a little background um, and explain why we're doing this all in, in the first place. Um, I indicated in my earlier remarks this morning that all of these equality rights that people with disabilities have on paper uh, don't mean anything if they're not effectively implemented and that the legal profession uh, plays a central role in making sure that they are effectively implemented. Well, the question then arises as to whether the legal profession is adequately making, meeting the legal needs of persons with disabilities. Um, this uh, was the subject of a judicial inquiry 10 years ago. Uh, I am confident that most, if not all of you, have never heard of this. Um, then Attorney General Roy McMurtry appointed then Family Court Judge uh, Rosalie Abella to do this inquiry. This was before she did her famous inquiry on employment uh, equality. And she undertook to see whether the legal profession was adequately meeting the legal needs of persons with disabilities with a particular focus on Ontario. Um, and she rendered a report that had some pretty um, depressing uh, conclusions. She found that uh, people with disabilities have, if you will, more than the average legal needs. That is to say, compared to most other folks, people with disabilities have a greater, on average, number of legal needs. And this is hardly surprising because people with disabilities, because of their impoverishment, because of their unemployment, because of the discrimination they faced, and because of their dependency on uh, government bureaucracies and private sector nonprofit charitable bureaucracies, uh, for all of these reasons, they, they're likely to have more situations where they are vulnerable and where they need protection and the assistance of lawyers. Well, that was one of the things she found. The other thing she found is that of all minority groups in Ontario, people with disabilities were among the most underserved by our legal profession. Um, it's 10 years later, and sadly, I don't think there have been a whole lot of huge dramatic changes. There have been some incremental reforms. One of the reforms that uh, Judge Abella, now Justice Abella, proposed was that disability rights matter should be required for all legal education in law schools and in uh, the bar admission course. Um, basically, to a school, none of the law schools in the province did very much, if anything, about it. In fact, of our six law schools, one is totally inaccessible to wheelchairs, and the other five are only partially accessible, not uh, accessible on full and equal terms. Um, that's how they deal with physical access, much less curriculum situations. Accordingly, um, it was decided that it was appropriate to start providing for focused legal education on disability-related matters. And there are two curriculum items that are specifically needed to infuse equality into the practice of law for persons with disabilities beyond what we've done this morning already. One is to talk about acting for a person with a disability, the personal, the human side, if you will, the personal need side. That's what we're doing now. And then this afternoon, talking about the substantive curriculum. It is our understanding that this will become required curriculum for the bar admission course next year, as well as this is being videotaped so it can be made available for other continuing legal education initiatives uh, elsewhere. So that's a little background as to why it matters uh, to deal with all of this stuff. And uh, to take us through this, our chair is Stan Delaney, who is the outreach uh, responsible, uh, the worker responsible for outreach and education with advocacy, uh, the Advocacy Resource Center for the Handicapped. And I understand Paul is going to introduce the others involved in this uh, panel as well. As, as this is a rather crowded uh, panel, we only have half present at the moment, and, uh, and we'll, we'll bring the others on at, uh, at half time. Uh, but uh, you've been introduced to, to Stan and to David, and to their immediate right is Paul Pellman, whose biography does not appear in your materials, but it is being copied separately and will be available 
um, at the registration desk outside. His practice focuses on family law with uh, criminal and, uh, and estate work as well. Uh, sitting just beyond him is Don Potter, the executive interpreter for the Canadian Hearing Society, uh, who has also served as uh, interpreter to MPP Gary Malkowski. And, uh, and just beyond him is Mr. Gordon Ryle, who is the executive director of the Canadian Hearing Society. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'd just like to, before we start, uh, draw your attention to the document in your package called what, is, what If Your Next Client Has a Disability. This was developed some time ago in 1988 um, for the bar admission course. <laughs> Uh, I should preface by saying that this document is um, in the state of development. It, um, it has been brought to my attention that there has, uh, one member of the panel does have some concerns about the content and like any document that's supposed to reflect a diverse uh, number of needs, uh, it'll always be subject to correction so it's probably never going to be um, uh, up to date but we will uh, continue to work on it and if any of you in the future would like to uh, have subsequent drafts or copies of it um, all you'd have to do is uh, contact us at ARCH. I, I would now like to uh, get um, Gord and Paul to give us a bit of a demonstration which will help illustrate some of the issues around um, relating to people with uh, who are deaf. Thank you very much Dan. In preparing for this, uh, we weren't exactly sure how we wanted to approach this except to give you some ideas of the do's and don'ts of how to deal with a deaf or hearing impaired client. So when I thought of preparing for this morning's little <coughs> program, the way I've approached it is saying, welcome to the practice of representing a deaf client. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit about Paul Pellman, or let you see Paul Pellman in action as representing his first deaf client. Today I'm going to be seeing a client who is, uh, I'm told, deaf and mute. This is the first deaf client I'm going to have and uh, I'm happy to see that I'm going to have a sign language interpreter with me. And they come into my office and here is Gord and Don. Now Gord, I understand that you wear a hearing aid. Uh, uh, is it alright if I speak a little bit louder? W will that help you a little? No. Now, Gord, my understanding is that most deaf people can read lips. Can you, uh, Gord, uh, hello Gord? <coughs> Gord, can you read my lips? Not really. Just a little bit. Just for your information, most deaf people only can read about 30% of what you're saying. That's the average. Now, Gord, how old are you? <laughs> Don, how old is Gord? That is, that is not acceptable that you speak with the interpreter. You should be speaking directly to me. The interpreter's role is to interpret for the two of us, not to answer directly. So there shouldn't be conversations between yourself and the interpreter. Geez, one of these days I'm going to figure out how to do this right. You know, Helen Keller once said that uh, being deaf was much worse, much more difficult than being blind. And uh, over the years I've, uh, I've realized why, and that is that the essence of being human is the ability to communicate and that is probably the most difficult problems in dealing with deaf clients. Um, we're very lucky to have Gord today who's the executive director of the Hearing Society and Don Potter. And <clears throat> we're going to talk to you a little bit about some of the ways in which you can really maximize your time with deaf clients. Um, I think it's trite to say that for any lawyer, gathering facts, getting a good knowledge of the basic information before rendering legal opinion is the most important thing. And if you don't have your facts proper or straight from the client, you will not be able to properly serve them. I've been doing this for I guess coming on 14 years and I'm forever amazed at how much I learn each and every day from different deaf clients who have different 
communication needs. Um, Gord, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about what you see as some of the problems that some lawyers have in dealing with a deaf or a hearing impaired client. Yeah. We have very limited time, but I would like to cover five major points. I think it's important that when you do meet with a deaf client, you communicate directly with that person. Go ahead and communicate with them as if they are a hearing person. The interpreter is there to make sure the communication flows smoothly, but you as the lawyer work directly with your client. And I know that lawyers do love to, to use very colorful language, so it's important to sometimes make sure you're using very plain English for your deaf clients. Some deaf clients may be able to understand that terminology, but most will not. I think it's also very important that lawyers take advantage of the opportunities they have to learn about the role of the interpreter. The interpreter's role is to take what the hearing person says in English and transmit that in ASL to the deaf client and vice versa. That's basically what the interpreter does and nothing else. The fourth point is to be aware of the code of ethics that interpreters should follow. It's important for the lawyers and the clients both to be aware of, to know that there is a code of ethics. The code of ethics includes, for example, confidentiality. The interpreter must maintain a neutral position. In other words, the interpreter does not become involved in the process itself. And the next point is that as a lawyer, you don't necessarily have to understand American Sign Language. You can use an interpreter. There are interpreters available from different sources, such as the Canadian Hearing Society, or Connections, Silent Voice, and BRCD, the Bob Rumble Center for the Deaf. I guess is, that's it. Thank you, Gord. Before Don makes some comments about interpreting, let me discuss a few logistic things. You can't really see it here today, but generally speaking, when I have a deaf client in my office, I make use of a round table. I have a desk, but I don't really use it for client interviews. The round table is the most important because you as the solicitor should be sitting across from the deaf person with the sign language interpreter off to the side so that really the visual communication is directly between the client and the solicitor. You may not see it with Gord because of the way we're set up with Don a little bit behind me. But you'd be amazed how deaf clients make use of the visual cues from not only the interpreter, but you. <clears throat> they are watching the interpreter, but they also see you. So the use of your body language is extremely important. Um, many of us are often taught not to show emotion or um, um, don't accentuate ourselves well, our words, our expression. With deaf clients, I think you're most successful if you do the exact opposite. You want to make sure that they get the gist of what you are saying as best as you possibly can. And if sometimes that means asking the interpreter to repeat something, that's fine. Now, think about this for a minute. Most of you develop most of your knowledge at an early age from hearing what other people say. Mom says I should do this, Daddy says I should do that television, radio, whatever, tells us things. The perspective that deaf people have, especially those who are deaf from a very early age of birth, is somewhat different. Similar to a computer receiving input, in my opinion, the input that a deaf person receives at a very early age is not as great as a hearing person. 
And how that affects them is their perceptions of life and what we do. And I say this to raise the issue of the fact that some deaf clients are not altogether clear on what lawyers do. And that may sound basic and fundamental to some people, but I don't think it is. And I think that the deaf client has to know what it is that you're there for, how you can assist them. And in addition to that, I don't mind taking the interpreter aside before the interview begins if I've been told the nature of the problem, just to tell them the, what type of case this is, just so that they're not in the dark for the first 20 minutes interpreting something which they really may not understand. Like, I'll say to them, um, Don, uh, this is a divorce issue that we're dealing with here today, and uh, just so that they has, he has an idea of what's going to happen. Um, <clears throat> I'm not that concerned about Don and a divorce, but sometimes I do get a little concerned when I may get a sign language interpreter from one of the, um, the churches and I'm dealing with a sexual assault of a young girl and I want to speak to the interpreter at first to make sure that we're on board. I want to speak to the interpreter not only to find that they can properly interpret Gord or the client, that they can understand the nature of the problem, but in addition that they have no family or other connection. Sometimes I may have a lawsuit that involves a sexual assault at the, forgive me, the Bob Rumble Center for the Deaf. If I have an interpreter from the Bob Rumble Center for the Deaf, that, that may not work out very good. And of course, many deaf clients don't know anything about confidentiality. So their biggest concern is, why don't I bring a family member just to interpret for me? Because I really don't want anybody to know. Number one, they've got to know that the relationship is confidential. Number two, Family members are sometimes the worst people because they're not trained as interpreters and they may edit. One final point before we go over to Dawn. You don't need to know sign language to properly represent deaf clients. Doesn't hurt, but it's not always necessary. But what you do need to know is some basics about the language and communication because a few times in my practice, I've had to say to the interpreter, Don, I don't think you're interpreting what I'm saying. Uh, or Don, um, the pauses are a little too long before you interpret what I'm saying. This is very complicated stuff. And I'm talking for five minutes, and then you're signing for one minute. Are we missing something in the translation? And sometimes that happens. Um, or sometimes I will see that the deaf person is upset with the interpreter. <clears throat> They're anxious. Remember one thing. Just like with hearing people, when you're nervous, your communication is more limited. You're not as verbal, not as communicative. You're, you're anxious. Deaf clients are the same way. When they come to see me for the first time, their communication skills, even through sign language, are not as good as they usually are. Their basic communication is not as good, and their understanding is not as good. You have to be aware of that, and that may happen. The other, the other final thing I want to say is what I call, that some deaf people have, which is I call the yes mentality. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Are you sure you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. Can you lip read? Yes. By the way, I should tell you, every deaf person can lip read the sentence, can you lip read? <laughs> <laughs> Because every frigging hearing person has asked them that. The, the problem is they cannot lip read the next sentence that you're going to tell them because they don't know what the hell it is. So, uh, and, and as Gord says, many words in the English language look the same on the lips. To give you what, but one example, principal and policeman. If you want to mouth them, they look exactly the same on the lips. They obviously mean different things. Lip reading isn't going to work, but most deaf people will, will tell you they use lip reading and signs, so they use all of the above. Gord has a hearing aid. I haven't asked him about his hearing loss, but I can only presume that he may have some residual hearing. With that in mind, I'm going to use my regular voice. I'm going to speak as I normally do, but I'm going to speak to him in the hopes that he not only picks up my body language, Don interpreting, but, some of, but, but, but the voice itself. Don, you've probably run up against some lawyers who 
aren't the greatest communicators with deaf clients. Tell us some of the do's and don'ts that you see from your vantage point, even though you normally can't comment on this. Uh, well, Paul is right, because one thing you don't do is ask the interpreter to step out of their role while they're interpreting. Right now, I'm signing and speaking at the same time, but the problem is, because the first language is English, my signing changes from American Sign Language to an English mode, and the information is not as clear for Gordon. Some deaf people who have a very strong basis in ASL wouldn't understand my signing. So, but I can't just speak, because they'll be offended that they don't know what I'm talking about. Um, I think it's important when you're hiring an interpreter to work with you that you make sure of the interpreter's qualifications. Um, it's obviously difficult for you to judge, but you can ask what credentials they have. Do they have, there, there's a national organization called AVLIC, the Association of Visual Language Interpreters of Canada. They have a national certification program, but it's very new, so very few interpreters have that. You can ask if they have Secretary of State registration, which is related to the federal government. You can ask if they're registered with Ontario Interpreter Services. Um, those are the basic registries or certifications that they could have. At least you'll know they have some basic skills because they've already taken a skills screening. Also, if you are interested in learning more about interpreting in deaf culture, the Canadian Hearing Society has a workshop that's prevent, presented monthly. It's mainly focused on employers, but they go into depth about deaf culture, interpreting. They include many deaf people who speak for themselves. It's, it's an all-day workshop. Lunch is provided, I think. Um, <laughs> it's important on how you set up your room. You don't want windows behind you because the sun coming in is very difficult on the eyes. Um, you want to make sure there's not a lot of background noises, especially if the person uses a hearing aid. Um, make sure the interpreter is seated next to you. So as was already explained, the deaf person can watch both and take advantage of the signing, lip reading, body language altogether. Um, and also know that errors do happen. Just as two hearing people communicating will miscommunicate sometimes. We make mistakes and we should be willing to admit that, but you should feel comfortable to interrupt to clarify. Um, and please do that instead of using the interpreter as an excuse to throw out the case, which was my first court <laughs> experience. It was an auto body shop situation and a deaf person was suing the auto body for bad work and they talked about the paint job and it was all bubbled and they, they said violet was wrong. So I said the color violet was wrong. The opposition lawyer said, well, let's throw this out because it's obvious they don't understand each other because the auto body secretary's name is Violet. But any interpreter would make that mistake. So clarify, and I think that's it. We often talk about not judging a book by its cover, and I'm telling you that you will see, as you get to know your deaf clients better, that they present as far different people than the ones that originally walk into your office. Uh, the use of a good, comfortable, qualified sign language, sign language interpreter makes your job that much easier. And if you want to continue to use that person in the future for your follow-up visits, I always suggest it when you phone the Hearing Society, you ask for that individual. Now, <clears throat> some other problems. Yeah. Okay. Dave, Dave's giving me a, a little nudge, a not so, so subtle nudge. <laughs> One of the only he can do that. He's going to hit me with Miss Kane in a minute, I think. I, I knew it was <laughs> I knew it was <laughs> um, It still doesn't work, you notice. <laughs> How do you follow up with deaf clients like you would with hearing clients where you make large use of the phone? In my opinion, number one, using basic language and putting as much into writing as you can is probably the best. And you know what? In family law, we do a lot of offers to settle where we now insist on our clients signing them. No harm in doing that with any deaf client on any case where you write back to them and say, 
It's my understanding that the facts are as follows. We'll make sure they read it, make any corrections, and sign it so that you're aware of exactly what's going on. One final thing, you will see as you represent more and more deaf clients that you learn more. More about the nature of the language, more about their use of sequence and events. Don't feel afraid to ask questions. Um, and don't be afraid to express your ignorance because they know that you don't know a great deal about the nature of the language difficulty. It is, in my opinion, a profound difficulty that affects not only the way people think, but the way they communicate. Uh, it's nice to see a few familiar faces here today, and I knew, uh, know a number from the Bard Mission course. I hope I see a lot of you doing this. I've been doing this for almost 14 years, and I'm, it's sad to say that there aren't more people out there doing it. I'd like there to be, so I wish you well. Um, thank you very much, Paul, Gordon, and Don, for your demonstration and your uh, um, good counsel on uh, the issues. I would now like um, David Lepofsky to give us some uh, uh, insights into um, how to relate to people who are blind. And while David is speaking, if we could do it quietly, could we have the rest of the speakers come up to the stage? We are running a little bit behind. Living um, with any visible disability, meaning one that is apparent to others, and blindness fits into that if you carry a white cane, um, is a real study in human nature because you marvel at how people try to outdo each other for treating you in the most bizarre ways. <laughs> um, and uh, Paul said that with uh, hearing impaired folks, you should uh, feel free to ask questions to inform yourself. Uh, the same goes with any disability. Uh, we know that there is uh, two things, uh, three things that are prevalent uh, out there. One is that most people don't know very much about our disability, and I'll talk about blindness, but it relates to others. Um, the second is that they're dying to know. There's some fixation or curiosity out there about it. And third, they're embarrassed to ask. And uh, I can assure you that there is no question that any of you could think of that I haven't been asked dozens of times. And there's this incredible belief that you're sensitive about it. Uh, and, and again, particularly if you've been blind for a certain amount of time, I mean, you know the question's coming out before, before it does. So don't be shy as a lawyer to ask uh, basic questions that you need to know uh, about a visually impaired client in order to facilitate giving them service, like, do you have enough eyesight to read print? What is your method of reading? I, mean, I have people come up to me and say, I, I, I want to ask you something personal. Uh, and I don't want to embarrass you, but h how do you read your watch? Uh, personal? I mean, all right. <laughs> <laughs> and you flip it out, and you show there's the braille dots on it, and you put your fingers on it, and if your friends see it, they rearrange the hands, and that's the end of it. <laughs> OK. <laughs> but it, it, people just think that, that often think that if you're walking around as a blind person, you are living a life of unending misery. And I would say that before the social contract, we weren't. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, that's, that's life. Uh, the, there are a number of things that are very commonly believed about blind people which are untrue. Firstly, we don't use sign language. <laughs> <laughs> the second is that we don't have... I'm telling you, this is, I could do a survey of all these questions. The, uh, the second is that we, unless we have a hearing loss, we can hear just fine, and you don't have to yell at a blind person. And the third uh, uh, common uh, misconception um, is that we're, um, or, or m misbelief, is that somehow you're essentially dysfunctional. There are two stages to blindness, if you, only one if you're born blind, but two if you lose your vision partway through life, which is the way most people do if they lose their vision. The first stage is the initial advent of blindness, which is, uh, what you ex which is the sort of day or whatever that there's an accident or 
surgery goes wrong or whatever, uh, maybe a day and maybe gradual over time, but you then lose your eyesight. At that point, you used to read visually, you can't anymore. You used to walk around guiding yourself visually, you can't. You've got a whole bunch of limitations. That's the early stage of going blind. That's the brief stage. It may be months, maybe years, depends on the individual. But the, the, after rehabilitation training, learning to use a white cane, learning how to read Braille or whatever, you enter the phase of being blind, which is living with the adaptive techniques and technologies and methods that you have. And for you at that stage, the stage of going blind, the stage of disorientation, confusion, whatever, is long gone. It's ancient history. It's irrelevant. Um, you will no doubt at some time in your life have thought that what you want to do is find out what it's like to be blind so you close your eyes and the first thing you do is fall over something and figure that's what blind people must go through, total disorientation. I can tell you that if the lights went out in here, you would be falling over something, but I wouldn't. <laughs> In fact, I would be offering help to you, back to my concept of relativity of disabilities. Um, and therefore, um, it is wrong to, unless your client is a newly blinded individual, they will have been adjusted to their, had the opportunity to adjust their blindness a long time ago, and uh, you're just at an age of working, a stage of working on mechanics. If you're delivering client services to a blind client, I mean, there's a number of things you want to deal with. The first is, um, Mobility. If they're going to come and see you and they've identified that they're blind, you're going to want to talk to them about working out an arrangement to meet them. Whether if they, are in, uh, if they have accessible transit available and they're comfortable with the TTC, that you may just have to give them detailed description of how to get there. Otherwise, you might arrange for one of your secretaries or whatever to assist the person if you tell them you'll meet them at a subway stop or whatever. There's all sorts of ways of doing it. It's not a big deal. You shouldn't presume that they're incapable of getting uh, to where you are, rather just discuss if they have any mobility needs and if there are ways that you might assist. Uh, okay. The, um, he's telling me that Paul should finish already. Um, anyway, the, um, the next is access to printed uh, material. If you're going to be going over a contract or an affidavit or a will, or whatever, um, don't just assume the person has access to technology which will make that accessible. A lot of the technology is expensive. Some people have it, some don't. And it's fair to say, look, we're going to be dealing with some printed material. What kind of uh, information format is the best for you? And, if, and it may be as simple as arranging, because of this confidentiality of it, if you're sending them a their will, I don't think they're going to want to send it to the CNIB to be read on tape by a complete stranger. Um, it may be a matter of, say, preparing a draft and having um, your secretary or someone read it onto a tape and, and mail them or deliver the tape to them, and they can listen to it. Um, different blind people use different reading formats. Very few use Braille. Braille is used by a minority of blind people. There's tape recording. There's large print. Um, uh, and, and there's, if you take a computer disk, if you have a, a talking computer, you pop it, the computer reads. So there, there are different techniques, and you just ask the person what, what would be the most effective way to get that information to them. The final thing in my last 15 seconds I'll deal with is if you're dealing with um, a litigation environment, um, it's important to spend some time with a blind client to orient them to the environment they're going to be in. If they're going to be testifying in a courtroom, you go through the same steps you go with everybody, with anyone, but it's also, well, I mean, I'll tell you, when I go to a courtroom and it's counsel, I try to get there early and I pace it out and I try to figure out what's what. Because the, the, if the person's going to be a witness, they're going to want to know where the judge will be sitting and let them s sit or stand up there and get a sense of, you know, if you put them in the witness box and you, for a moment, elevate yourself to the bench, it's the only time you'll be there. Um, <laughs> and sort of say, here I am, and so the person can try to make eye contact and that sort of thing. There are those kinds of practical things. There's really no enormous barriers. It's just a matter of using a little practical sense and thinking it through, and the client will be your best guide. So, thank you. Thank you very much, David. I'll just seize the opportunity to introduce the remaining members of the, uh, of the panel who've uh, joined us uh, at my uh, furthest right is Ron McInnes, who practices with Faskin Campbell Godfrey, uh, formerly in civil litigation and now in uh, real estate, and is a uh, vice president of Arch. And to his immediate left is uh, Harry Beatty, the director of policy and research uh, at Arts, uh, at Arch, excuse me, and of course uh, co-chair uh, with David Lepofsky and uh, <coughs> excuse me, Mary Louise Dixon. 
uh, to uh, his immediate left is Sam Savona, coordinator of the housing project at PUSH Ontario. Uh, it stands for Persons United for Self-Help, and uh, among other activities is on the Accessibility Advisory Committee of the Toronto Transit Commission. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from uh, Sam and Harry. Sam will speak to you about um, issues around speech uh, impaired people and uh, Harry will interpret for Sam. Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to thank Harry for interpreting for me. First of all, I would like to thank Harry for interpreting for me. But um, if Harry wasn't here, my first comment would be uh, if you didn't hear me or didn't understand me, I would appreciate if you would ask me to repeat myself. But if, if Harry weren't here to interpret for me, my first request would be if you couldn't hear me or couldn't understand me, that you would ask me to repeat myself. Um, I think that would the most, the most important word you could say to me is what? I, I think the most important word you could say to me is what? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, uh, um, there are other communication devices you can use as well. I'm in your document there. Um, we talk about business demolish. There are other communication devices you could use as well. In the materials, we talk about bliss symbolics. Um, they, they are, I don't use them myself, but I have become known of them. And what they are is little Symbols that represent words. I don't use them myself, but I'm familiar with what they are, and they are little symbols that represent words. Uh, underneath, <laughs> don't worry, <laughs> you won't have to know what the symbols are <laughs> because, um, Underneath each symbol are uh, the printed words. Don't worry, you won't have to learn what the symbols are because underneath each symbol is the printed word. Um, you and I hate you generalize a lot because each individual is different. But usually, when the person uses the symbol, there is an individual version as well. There's an interpreter um, for them? Yeah. yeah okay. um, usually, and I, I don't like to generalize because people are different, but when people use bliss symbolics, there is an interpreter for them as well. 
I'm, I'm not making everyone else. I, I guess I'm not busy. I, I do not have a lot to say about this, but I would like to end my um, section with um, a personal experience I had. Uh, I don't have too much more to say, but I would like to end this section with a personal experience which I had. Um, I live independently on my own, in my own apartment. I live in a building in my own apartment. Independent. Oh, I live independently in my own apartment. Sorry, Sam. <laughs> it's okay. You, you are there. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> You have to accommodate us. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, in, I'll interpret for Harry. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, one day I am. Um, I wanted them. To, I wanted to order out, and I ordered chicken. One day I wanted to order out, and I ordered chicken. So I phoned and I placed the order without any problem. I phoned and I placed the order without any problem. And they, they came and gave me the bill and I paid them. They came and they gave me the bill and uh, I paid him. Um, it was a good meal. <laughs> um, <laughs> a couple of months ago, a couple of months after, I had friends over for dinner. A couple of months ago. Oh, couple of, it was a good meal. A couple of months ago, I had a friend over for dinner. And, um, we did it with three sides. We wanted chicken. So she um, placed the oil using my name. We decided to um, or order chicken, so she placed the order using my name. No, again. The chicken arrived and we had our dinner and again the food was good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, again the chicken arrived and we had our meal and again the food was good. So she was cleaning up the hat and um, she happened to look at the bill. So she was cleaning up uh, the, the, or picking up the package and she happened to look at the bill. And she goes, my God, then, you're not going to let them get away with this. And she said, my God, Sam, you're not going to let them get away with this. And, um, I look at the bill because I thought maybe they charge me too much. So I, I looked at the bill because I thought maybe they charged me too much. But um, no, uh, it was the right amount and I did what's wrong. But no, it was the right amount, and I asked, what's wrong? And he said, um, look what they put under your name. She said, look what they put under your name. So I read it again, 
and it said, Sam Sabona, he is mentally retarded. The writing said, Sam Savona, he is mentally retarded. No, um, the point is, over the phone, um, the voice does not reflect the personality. So the point is that over the phone, the voice does not reflect the person's personality. Personality. I like to end my part on that note. I'd like to end my part on that note. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, next, we will have Ron McInnes talking about uh, mobility impairments and invisible impairments. And Ron, you're going to be Superman because you're going to have to do it in five to six minutes. <laughs> first. Okay, it's um, for obvious reasons um, I'm doing mobility disimpairment, impairments I should say. Um, many people have mobility uh, impairments, but only a few actually use wheelchairs. But if places are accessible for wheelchairs, then there should be no problem with, uh, with anyone else. So for that uh, reason, I'm just going to concentrate a few remarks on uh, accessibility for uh, for wheelchairs. A lot of this, um, I've always hoped uh, by this point had become obvious to most people, but um, whenever I find myself in a new situation, I always find that a new problem has, uh, has cropped up that uh, it never occurred to me that uh, it would not have occurred to someone else. But one thing um, you should look at, I guess the first thing, um, if you're going to be dealing with uh, someone who is in a wheelchair, or for that matter, if you have an office and uh, you you may find yourself some time with a an employee at a wheelchair, or an articling student, or perhaps a lawyer, and it's important, I think, to take an inventory of your offices and depending on whether you're in a new office tower or an old house or whatever the case may be, there's differences in what you can do. But some of the things to look at are, of course, steps, because uh, sometimes even a two-inch lip can be a barrier. It may not be for someone in a manual chair with a great deal of upper body strength that can lift themselves over it. Uh, for me, in a heavy wheelchair with a tie-down device at the back, um, a two-inch lip can be a, a considerable problem. So you could look at things as such as whether uh, a small ramp could be, uh, could be put on. If you have stairs, you can also look at, uh, at more ramping, which may or may not be practical. Um, if you want to look at some guidelines as to what gradient there should be on ramps and things, uh, the Ontario Building Code is a good guide. It's, it's not uh, mandatory other than for new construction and substantial renovations, but it does give uh, a good guideline as to what, uh, what is acceptable. Uh, within your own office, if you have a client coming in in a wheelchair, uh, give some thought to um, corridors and doors. Uh, doors aren't usually a problem. They're usually wide enough, uh, except for washrooms, which tend to have smaller doors. They also seem to tend to have uh, two doors, which uh, require a right-hand turn, which often is impossible for a wheelchair, which is um, something I've never really understood, but that you find almost everywhere. Um, got to look at turning radius from corridors into rooms and uh, whether or not you've got your, uh, your files and uh, cartons and things parked in the corridors and uh, things along that line. Another area, of course, is carpets. For someone in a manual wheelchair, a uh, thick pile can be a problem. But I think one of the problems that people don't see as often or think of as often are uh, loose carpets. Uh, these can quite easily catch under wheels, both the manual and electric wheelchairs. Um, you end up pulling them out of the way. And this, this is something that could be easily dealt with if someone was coming into your office and you had that situation. 
you obviously can't pull up your um, broad loom, but uh, uh, any loose carpets that are in your uh, reception area or whatnot could be moved out of the way. Um, offices or conference rooms, you want to make sure you've got enough room wherever you're meeting someone that uh, there is room for a wheelchair. They do take up more space, they need a certain turning radius, and it will vary with the type of wheelchair. Another problem I often run into is the, uh, the height of tables or, um, or desks and the fact that they often have ledges underneath. You know, they look nice and high until you try to get your knees under and find out you can only go two inches, which makes it a little difficult to work. Um, it was one of the uh, reasons why I gave up the practice of uh, litigation, was going into too many uh, hearing rooms and uh, courtrooms and finding I couldn't get out of the, uh, under the desk completely. Uh, I can't begin to tell you how many cases I conducted uh, balancing my briefcase on my lap and trying to uh, use books and factums and everything back and forth uh, in that manner. It's, uh, it's quite a juggling act and uh, it takes something away from your concentration when you're worrying about uh, dropping all your papers every two seconds. Um, as I mentioned in the, uh, in the materials uh, to remaining at the same eye level as someone in a wheelchair, and normally you would, you'd be sitting down in your office and you're talking to someone. Um, it's, uh, frankly, it's more of a problem with cocktail parties and things. Uh, I always get a very stiff neck at uh, cocktail parties as you're always looking up at, uh, at someone unless, unless they sit down on, you know, one of the few chairs that are usually available. But something else I've given up going to most of the time are cocktail parties. Um, Washrooms are a major problem because you need large areas for wheelchairs for turning and especially easy to open doors. Um, these washrooms are easy to design but they're costly to put in as renovation. But if you're in an office tower, something you might look at is whether there is an accessible washroom somewhere in the building uh, that could be used and that you could make known to your client. Um, at the Toronto Dominion Center where our offices are, uh, this building was built in 1967 and uh, at a time when barrier-free design was not really in vogue. But over the last couple of years, we've had a committee working on it and a lot of new uh, innovations have been in, installed by way of renovations, uh, more sensitive detectors and elevator doors, so I no longer get the doors crashing into my chair as I uh, try to get into the elevator anymore. There are automatic doors on each of the buildings where you can just push a button, such as the, uh, similar to the ones uh, for this building now. There's signage indicating the, how to get to uh, accessible washrooms, how to get to the appropriate elevators um, for wheelchairs. They have guides for barrier-free access uh, throughout the center. And uh, they built a wheelchair accessible washroom in the concourse. And I think two of the other major tenants have them in their premises. Um, a resource for this type of material uh, is the Barrier Free Design Center. If anyone um, is interested in doing an appraisal um, and seeing perhaps what it might cost to do certain things, then I would recommend them. And there are others as well, but uh, they do a lot of this. You should also keep in mind that um, someone coming to your office or getting to a court or a tribunal, you have to consider uh, transportation. And in the case of wheelchairs, if it's someone like myself who has my own vehicle, then I need to know things like whether there's parking nearby and whether it's wide enough that I can get the ramp down on my vehicle without coming out later and finding out that someone has blocked it off so that I'm stuck there for the day. Um, it should also be near an accessible entrance. If someone is coming using Wheeltrans, the uh, TTC's uh, transit system, then uh, you should keep in mind that they can't always get the times they want. Uh, they don't always run on schedule, so you should be flexible about meeting times. And uh, in setting up meetings, at the moment they require three days notice in order to get a booking on the Wheeltrans system. This is supposed to change around the end of the year, but those difficulties uh, exist for someone in a wheelchair who doesn't have their own transportation getting to your office or, or to a hearing room. Although now there are accessible taxis in Toronto that uh, um, have alleviated some of those problems. 
two minutes, Ron. Okay. Um, with courts or hearing rooms, um, the same sort of questions arise. Um, the have been there have been a lot of government initiatives for courtrooms that have uh, uh, made a lot of them uh, accessible. But um, if you have a disabled client, you're going to a court or a hearing room. It's still wise to to call ahead and advise them so that they can make special arrangements. Um, in the past, I've done this a couple of times in courts that I wasn't familiar with to find that I was scheduled in a courthouse, or a courtroom rather, that actually had a step into it. But by calling ahead, we were able to get the hearing room changed and, uh, and avoid the problem. So it's better to prepare ahead. Um, just to close off, I had been asked to uh, deal with invisible disabilities as well. And I think all I'm going to say about that is that the material that you have that Stan referred to earlier uh, has sections on uh, some of the invisible disabilities, AIDS, HIV, people with head injuries, people with learning disabilities, and people with epilepsy. Um, there's an excellent discussion in the materials on those various things beginning at page 30. I think the practical suggestions that are given, especially for uh, people with head injuries and people with learning disabilities, are very useful uh, because they're in those cases, there is a very great danger of miscommunication unless you are aware of the differences in the way people with these uh, problems communicate and the way they understand and the way they behave. And I think it's very important that uh, whether or not you're anticipating a client uh, at, that, at this point or whether you're uh, just want some general knowledge in case uh, someone comes in who hasn't revealed this problem to you and you can recognize it, that you familiarize yourself with some of those practical suggestions. And with that, I'll conclude as close to my two minutes as possible. Thank you, Ron. Um, we're going to conclude with Harry Beattie. Harry is going to speak briefly about uh, people with psychiatric disabilities. You have about five minutes. Thanks, Stan. Uh, actually, I'm not going to just confine my marks to clients with uh, psychiatric disabilities, but really any disability which may impact or be perceived to impact on a person's capacity, including developmental disability, severe closed head injury, and so on. There is a lot of, of uh, very specific and important law related to incapacity. Uh, the Mental Health Act and the Mental Incompetency Act in particular. I sh you should be aware that the Mental Incompetency Act is going to be replaced by new legislation in Ontario. There's a package of four bills which passed the legislature in December and have received royal assent but have not been proclaimed in force. These are the Advocacy Act, the Substitute Decisions Act, the Health Care Consent Act, which largely deals with incapacity, and a fourth uh, act, uh, which makes consequential amendments to the other three, to other statutes. So these will define a new system dealing with incapacity. What I am going to talk about today, though, is um, more the presumption of capacity that there is a, a strong presumption in the law of our province that adults are capable of making their own decisions. And citizens are entitled to that presumption that just because someone has a significant psychiatric disability, in fact, may be in a psychiatric hospital, just because someone is, you're, you're told someone is moderately or even severely developmentally handicapped, uh, just because someone's comments may appear repetitive or irrational does not mean that in law they lack capacity and does not mean that uh, you would refuse to take instructions from them. At the same time, of course, there are adults who do lack capacity to make decisions and you have to be sure that their rights are respected as well. So perhaps if I just started with an example, uh, 
Suppose you are practicing family law. Your client is a woman who has just come out of psychiatric hospital. Uh, she has now been served with, or she is, she is now separated from her husband. Her husband has custody of the children. She is receiving family benefits, uh, social assistance for people with disabilities. The husband has custody of the children. And her husband, who has been represented by counsel, has had his counsel draft a separation agreement, which gives her no support and only very restricted access to the children. In other words, not a very good deal. Your client comes in and is, A, very upset about this deal, but also tells you that she does not believe she can stand the stress of an additional fight and wants this matter resolved as soon as possible. Not an unrealistic fact situation. Well, on the one hand, uh, you, want, you want to treat the person as, as capable, as uh, you want to follow her instructions, or you have a responsibility to do that if she's capable of doing so. But on the other hand, there is also a very considerable onus to make sure that she is actually making an informed decision. Because you can perhaps see that if you do not advise her carefully, that um, and she makes this deal unwisely uh, to, to the, the detriment of her rights, that your conduct as a solicitor may be called into question later. Aside from your responsibilities to your client at the time, there certainly may be issues raised later about your conduct as a solicitor in giving this advice, especially if she later on retains other counsel when perhaps she has recovered much more and seeks to have this agreement set aside. So it placed you in a very difficult situation. Um, how these two things are balanced, the presumption of capacity with, on the other hand, the need to respect the law that says that people must understand the nature and consequences of what they're doing, that could be the subject of a full day program. And all I can do in this limited time is, is, is point to a couple of things. Paul Pellman um, sort of warned about the involvement of family members. Often clients who have one of these disabilities will come to your office with a supporting person, I could put it that way, a family member, uh, a caseworker, someone of that nature. And that may be appropriate, but you have to be sure that you're getting your client's instructions, not what this person believes is in their best interests, unless you are, uh, you may have to make a determination that, that this person does need a substitute decision maker and that you can only take instructions if there is a litigation guardian. But if you are acting on the premise that your client is instructing you, uh, I would certainly recommend uh, talking to your client by himself or herself without the supporting person. You can imagine any number of scenarios where the supporting person may have a different perspective, perhaps with the best of intentions, but you must be instructed by your client. Um, uh, unfortunately, in terms of professional assessment, it still seems to be accepted that uh, physicians are all capable of doing this. Uh, many physicians really have no uh, training and capacity assessment, and, uh, but, but still courts and other bodies tend to look for an MD's assessment. In, it, it is better if, assess, if assessment for capacity is an issue to have the person assessed by psychiatrist or psychologist with appropriate training. For example, at the Baycrest Center in Toronto, there is a specialized competency team uh, who, who have uh, developed the art of competency assessment <laughs> past a certain point um, uh, to, to a more specialized level. Uh, other specialized resources that could help in this area, if, if a client is in a psychiatric hospital run by the provincial government, there's the Psychiatric Patient Advocate Office. Um, there, 
for, for people who are developmentally handicapped and in the community, uh, there are adult protective service workers who can be extremely helpful in, in, uh, in any matters involving court or legal proceedings. Under the Advocacy Act, one of the new pieces of, of legislation which I mentioned, there will be an advocacy commission and the advocacy programs established under this commission uh, will employ advocates who have specific roles in helping more clients in legal proceedings. So there is a lot of, uh, that is being developed both in terms of the law and in terms of new services in this area. But I would urge you again to look at these situations very, very carefully. You are going to have to deal with this in your practice in the family law context with a spouse or dependent. In the criminal context, there are going to be accused and witnesses uh, who have a disability. And, and the other thing is, is to talk to someone uh, especially if you can get someone whom the client or individual has confidence in and, and sort of look through the implications of the person being involved in this process. I'll just close with an example which, which shows the kind of thing that can be thought about is a um, case that I observed, I, I was not participating in except as an observer, where it was a, a, a complainant in a sexual assault case was a person with a very significant developmental disability. Uh, the person uh, was allowed to give evidence but not under oath and gave evidence in chief, then at the point of cross-examination by defense counsel simply refused to ask and answer any questions at all and clearly was quite agitated. But in this case, a person uh, who was not a witness, of course, but a person whom as a worker the individual had confidence in had been allowed to sit at the defense table, at, uh, at the table with the Crown and intervened and, set and, and, and was permitted by the judge to go and speak to the individual and the supporting person explained to the court that this individual did not understand or had forgotten whom, whom defense counsel was and that the question should be responded to. And what happened was that the defense counsel was brought over, formally introduced to the witness, shook hands, then the examination proceeded. It's a very small thing, but uh, if that had not been present, I don't think the evidence would have been given at all. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. As the last speaker, when lunch is delayed, I feel a little bit like a Tory candidate, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> turn it back to Stan for his closing comments. <laughs> Thank you very much, Harry. Um, I'm sorry that we didn't have the time to sufficiently allow the speakers to make a full presentation. As you can tell from the material, um, this group of people, the population of people with disabilities, which makes up 15% of the, the population in Ontario, is very diverse and can sometimes be complex. The document that, that you have in your handout, um, I think, if anything, if you, you read it um, carefully, you'll find that a lot of the, the advice in there is a lot of common sense. As David said earlier, uh, don't be afraid to ask a person with a disability questions. Much of our, our life is spent educating people mm. and correcting misperceptions. Um, if you ask a question that's inappropriate, you'll usually be told uh, quite clearly that you have done so. Um, we, we find that that is a part of um, what, what we have to deal with as people with disabilities in, in the community and hopefully uh, sessions like this will start to lift the veil of, of ignorance and misperception. Thank you very much.